Last year, I stood on the banks of the Brantas River in Indonesia, watching kids strip off and play in the evening sun. But this scene had a dark underbelly as I watched these kids dance in one of the most polluted rivers in the world. Despite the stink and the filth, these kids had felt the pull that draws humanity back to nature. I watched them and thought about the relationship between water, between people and plastics. And I could see these kids in the water, plastic in the water, the kids swallowing water. And it made me think about, is there plastic in these kids? What if the pollution that's coating our oceans is seeping through to our bodies, into our bloodstreams? It seems unlikely, you may think, but then we found plastic everywhere. A plastic bag has been found in the deepest sea trench. All that investment and innovation, those incredible scientists and explorers awaiting history only to be greeted by a plastic bag. Plastic's been found in sugar, it's been found in sugar, in shellfish, in insects, in seafood, it's been found in bottle tap and well water, it's been found in beer, in salt, in soft drinks, and it's been found in the water that we drink, the air that we drink, in our food, in our clothes, and in our feces. So are we polluting our bodies in the same way that we're polluting our oceans? I believe that every single one of us in this room has plastic in our bodies. But as WHO recently, the World Health Organization recently reminded us, we don't yet know how harmful this is. And I don't think we're understanding the shape or the scale of this threat fast enough. We don't know how plastic travels inside us. We don't know where it accumulates. It could be gathering in our spleens, our lungs, our hearts, our bones. We don't know if it can cross the blood-brain barrier like we do know it can in fish. And we don't know whether plastic concentrates toxins or does it clog our vital intersections as we've seen in sea creatures. We don't know how much plastic our bodies can take, but we do know enough that we need to act. I'm a sailor, scientist and activist, and I've spent most of my career devising solutions to the crisis and the problems that face our oceans. But before all of this, I'm a human, and I feel incredibly concerned about the health of our planet and fundamentally our health. Human health is an incredible motivator for change. Cigarettes, lead petrol, DDT, sun cream, and asbestos. The human health risk of plastic poses an incredible opportunity for a much greater change at a personal, local, national and international level. We must capitalise on this growing media and public engagement into ocean plastics pollution to ensure that we do influence systemic and long-term solutions, which currently I'm unsure that we're doing. We need holistic, flexible and affordable solutions if we're going to take care of human health and the health of our oceans. And we need to make them happen very, very quickly. By making strong scientific emotional, and, uh, emotional link between human health and plastics, we can move beyond talking about banning plastic straws because they harm sea turtles or about replacing one type of plastic because we know it's harmful for another type of plastic that we're not so sure about, to talk about the radical, systemic shift in the way that we think and value plastics. I've just returned from visiting, spending time with one of our projects on the river Brantas in Indonesia. And every time I go there, I'm absolutely I'm, I'm terrified. I'm becoming more and more terrified about how rapidly this crisis is scaling. We just don't have enough time to not uh, motivate radical action, to save ourselves and to save the ocean that is the greatest life support system on Earth. And this is what drives common seas every day. 
Our approach is to tackle plastic pollution crisis by identifying the opportunities for the larger scale change. We bring the right people together, we work together to create a thorough understanding of what's going on, and then we design, test, and implement practical, scalable solutions. We currently do this through four main projects through Plastic Drawdown, which is a policy analysis toolkit that supports governments to thoroughly understand the way that plastic flows through their economy and leaks out into their environment, to then design uh, appropriate mitigation strategies. And this is being effective in Indonesia, in the Maldives, uh, in Greece, and in the UK, and across 26 Commonwealth countries. We have a program called Clean Blue Alliance, which invests in and delivers practical and scalable solutions to support island communities to become plastic waste free. Um, Ocean Plastics Academy is a suite of curriculum aligned resources to empower and enable the next generation of sea champions. And Healthy Sea and Healthy Me is our world-leading investigation into understanding the impacts of human waste, uh, sorry, of um, the impacts of uh, mismanaged waste on human health, and the reason why we're here today. I think the guiding principle to all of our programs is to turn our insight into action, because we don't have time for anything else. Last year, we convened a group to discuss, uh, to better understand the impact of plastic on our health. We gathered 33 experts from across different disciplines to understand, is plastic actually a threat to, oursel to ourselves and our health? And if it is a threat, what level of threat is it? And what are the research priorities? And how do we think of new ways to alert and accelerate action? The outcome of this workshop convinced myself and our board that we should be prioritizing investment in research, and initially with three key priorities. The first one, to understand, is plastic building up inside us? Second, to understand, if it is building up inside us, what harm is it causing to us? And third, to understand, is the mismanaged waste acting as a vector for pathogens, toxins, causing disease? For the past 12 months, we've been working with scientists to identify how to detect uh, plastic particles in human blood, in tissues, and in breast milk. And this is world-first science, as we've been hearing today. We realized early on that existing approaches weren't adequate to separate the plastics from our sticky blood proteins to enable us to identify and measure the nano-sized plastic particles, those plastic particles that have the capability to travel through your blood-brain barrier or through the lining of your lungs and through the lining of your intestines. So those types of plastic particles that are capable of getting right in, inside us. So we've had to develop new uh, methods, which obviously has been complicated, and some ta taught us that science and advocacy don't always push to the same timelines, but obviously we remain committed in ensuring that we have robust evidence. Along the way, we've invested in some new technology at the VU in Amsterdam, and, that, and we're now running with the new system, and it's looking promising. In fact, I think we're all confident, I hope I'm not going to get told otherwise after this, but I think we all feel very confident that we've got the system in place to be able to tell us the truth about what plastics are inside our bodies. And all I can say is that if we continue sailing on this course, we'll be able to share results very soon. So what we will be, I'll be able to tell you, for the first time, I'll be able to tell you, we will be able to tell you whether there's plastic in our blood, how much plastic there might be in our blood, and what type of polymers, material types, are in our blood. And these findings are kind of the bedrock. They set us up to then look at the more, to, for further, most important discoveries about the impacts of plastic in our health. 
They, this methodology provides us with the knowledge to then understand how are plastics getting into our body and therefore how can we prevent them. Once plastic particles are in our body, do they accumulate in, in certain places? Does this accumulation start a fight with our immune system? And is, is that causing an inflammation? And is there a relationship between plastics and chronic inflammatory diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis, asthma, and Crohn's disease. So once we've certain about our method, we'll be analyzing samples from a range of people, from influencers and people living in cities to the kids that I was with a couple of weeks ago who are living on a waste dump in Indonesia. So we can start to find out who is most at risk and why. But ultimately, our research and science community can be guilty of spending too much time working to uncover the problems. And not enough time taking our science to the public. We must dedicate ourselves to the symbiotic partner of science and advocacy. Our challenge here isn't to create scientific, but well, it's not just to create scientific consensus but our aim must be to deliver robust proof points that can challenge the status quo of the multi-billion dollar plastics industry, that can alert those businesses and lobbyists that have invested in quadrupling the production of plastic, and that can inform the people that keep telling us that plastic is safe, that it's untouchable, because I don't think it is. In some ways, many of us in this room are irrelevant, we're already understanding the gravity and the complexity of plastic. We're already motivated by and dedicated by standing in its way, by shaping human capacity for renewal and for care. So we must use our evidence to start conversations that ricochet across global boardrooms, parliaments, schoolyards and headlines to bring the evidence and drive results that reach from the deepest sea trench on Earth to the sanctity of our bloodstreams. We have to grab the attention, we have to make waves, because if we don't, then no one else will. Thank you.